All right, let's get started on this very overcast Friday. So um, hopefully everybody has made it through their first week here back uh, at Marshall. Um, we're in lecture three. Um, we're going to begin our unit today on support reactions. Um, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. So I went ahead and updated the attendance from the previous lecture, so it's all uh, up to date. Um, I was mentioning this before class, but the lecture two recording, I was checking uh, uh, Panopto and it recorded like the first half hour of it. And then, I don't know, for some reason, uh, the, the way our recording software works, if the microphone's cut out, it stops the recording. So uh, what happened was it, it lost the last half of it. So what I did is I just uh, took last year's video and just appended it to the playlist so there would be something there. Um, Homework one was due uh, today at 11, so how did that go? Was uh, anybody have any issues on the Blackboard side of things? Hopefully that all was pretty smooth. And, and I uh, am hoping that that homework was pretty easy. I don't think it was really all that challenging. Hopefully it didn't take you that much time, right? That is probably one of the shorter assignments uh, we'll have in, uh, in the class, but when I say that we're having, when I say we have longer assignments, probably the homework that you see today is hopefully kind of a, an average representation uh, of the, the length of the homeworks in the class, because I'm not trying to bog you down uh, with homework. I'm trying to spread it out. Um, so there's going to be a homework assigned today. It's homework 2.1, so there's going to be a 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, because uh, we're in our second uh, main unit of the class uh, starting today, which is on external support reactions. Um, any questions? Uh, big picture before we get started? Okay. All right. So um, today is going to be statics um, review in, in a way. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to begin uh, the discussion of support reactions. And, and the way that I, that I handle this topic, and really any topic in this class, is I take the topic and we start easy. And then we just start, uh, um, I don't want to say increasing the difficulty, but we just start increasing the the, the, the load on that topic, as it were, a little bit at a time. So we're going to begin our topic on the split reactions, and we're going to start with some really basic problems, and then as we advance, the problems will get uh, more and more involved. Um, so, um, so let's just take a step back and make sure we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So remember, our goal uh, in this course, and our goal as structural analysts, um, is to assess the response of a structure when we apply some uh, load or some uh, uh, effect to it. Um, and so the first task in just about any structural analysis problem is to compute the support reactions. It's not to say it's the first task in every problem, but for most problems that's the case. Uh, and support reactions, uh, in short, are just the external forces that are applied to a system in order to keep the structure in static equilibrium. So here I have a table, and if I'm sitting on this table, I am applying a vertical force downward. I propose to you that the legs of the table, that between the legs and the ground, there, is, there, there are forces applied upward in order to keep the structure in equilibrium so that it's not moving. And so the first task is going to be to try and ascertain well, what are those forces in the legs or at the bottom of the legs to keep the, the table in equilibrium. And once we understand those, then we can start to determine later on what are the forces inside the table uh, in or that, are, that are required in order to develop equilibrium. And if we understand those, then we as structural engineers can then begin to start designing that table. Uh, how thick does this plank of wood need to be in order to safely uh, support the loads uh, that it's subjected to. And so that's sort of really the crux of structural engineering in general. So like this semester you're taking structural analysis, uh, and if you're interested, next semester I'll be teaching structural steel design. And so in steel design, what we would do is sort of take, let's say you've got responses from a structural analysis problem, how do you size elements uh, in order to safely resist those loads? So that's kind of the, the big picture. Um, so what we're going to do today is compute support reactions, uh, and we're going to do this for, for today and for the next week. Um, and as you recall, um, we're going to be using our three primary boundary conditions that we see here on the right. So we're talking about pen supports, roller supports, uh, and fixed supports. Today we're just going to focus on the top two. We have a lecture a little later that's devoted uh, specifically to uh, fixed supports and cantilever beams uh, and what have you. So today, these two uh, are the star of the show. Okay, uh, and I want to get right into it. Okay, so I want to begin with a really, really basic problem. Okay, 
So I have here a beam, okay? It is simply supported. I'm gonna pull up the notebook because uh, it's got everything up here as well. But we're gonna be do, uh, do this problem together uh, here in a second. Let me pull this up. I can take this and blow it up a bit. So this is gonna be our, our first problem in class beyond the, the classifications problems we did last time. Um, and we're gonna compute the support reactions on this beam uh, right here. So I'll, I'll give you a second to copy this down uh, and whatnot as you're, you're working on this. But uh, a couple notes about it. So first off, um, I have the term here, simply supported, okay? And again, what a simply supported structure means is that there are two boundary conditions on either end of the structure, and one is a pin support and the other is a roller support. So if I use the term simply supported, that's, that's what I mean. And, and from an a analyst or a structural engineering standpoint, it doesn't matter if this is the pin and this is the roller or vice versa. We would term both of those structures uh, as simply supported. Um, I have here uh, just a, a simple beam uh, and it is subjected to three loads that are applied vertically. So I have a 20 kip load, a 30 kip load, and an 18 kip load. Does everybody remember what the term kip means? One kip is what? A thousand pounds. So it's just shorthand for kilo pound. So this is 20,000 pounds, this is 30,000 pounds, and this is 18,000 pounds. Um, and one thing I'll say as you're copying this down, it is not unheard of in the world of, of structural engineering to see loads of, of this magnitude. I mean, we'll, if you take me for steel design, we'll see problems in steel design where we're designing columns for five, six, seven, eight hundred kips, no problem. So that, that happens uh, uh, pretty easily. Um, and we'll see some instances uh, even later in this semester where you can kind of wrap your head around that. <laughs> okay. So we have a beam, the beam is 30 foot long, uh, and we have the locations where the, uh, um, uh, where the loads are placed. I think we're at a point now where we can begin the process of doing some structural analysis. Now in order to do uh, the, 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 the task of this problem, which is to compute the support reactions, the first thing we need to do is we need to identify them. Okay? So I'm going to start backwards. I'm going to start uh, with support B. How many unknown support reactions are going to be at, at uh, uh, location B? One, okay, so we have a roller, okay? So we have one reaction, and because of the way the roller is oriented, it's a vertical reaction, okay? Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna make an assumption right now, and I'm gonna assume that that reaction is acting upwards, okay? Now, what I'm doing by making an assumption uh, that that's acting upwards is when I perform the calculations, the, the, I have to make an assumption in order to write my equations of equilibrium. So I'm going to assume that's upward, and we'll give it a name, and we'll call it BY. Now, the way that this will bear out in our calculations is I'm going to assume it's upward, and if I get a positive answer, that just means that assumption was correct, and it is, in fact, uh, acting upwards. If I solve for BY and I get a negative answer, bless you, uh, if I get a negative answer, it doesn't mean I need to develop any significant emotional distress. It just means I assumed upwards, and it's actually acting in the opposite direction. And to level with you, that is going to happen in here, where we have problems where there are oodles of support reactions, and it's sort of easier in those instances to maybe just assume they all act upwards and just let the math do what it's going to do. And so sometimes we'll get negative support reactions, and that's, that's perfectly okay. There are instances both in an analysis land and in the real world where that would be the case. Okay, so we have a vertical reaction here, B, Y. What about uh, A? How many support reactions there? Two. Two. So we have a vertical and a horizontal. So I'm going to call that AY. We'll go ahead and assume that's upward. And AX, let's do this. Okay. Uh, and sometimes what you'll see me do is you'll see me draw tick marks like this through the reaction forces. It's sometimes a way that I will delineate what's a known force and what's an unknown force, um, particularly as it relates to the reaction. So if you see me draw a tick mark there, that's what that means. Okay, now hopefully so far um, this is sort of serving as a statics review, like we've seen this stuff before. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll ramp it up uh, a little bit as the, uh, as the semester progresses, uh, but right now we're just taking it easy. Okay, so we have three unknown um, uh, support reactions, and we have three equations of equilibrium. So pop quiz based off our last homework assignment, um, how would I classify this structure? 
Statically determinate. Stable and statically determinate. That is correct. Which means, now what does statically determinate mean? Uh, means. What does that term mean? It means that I can solve for the unknowns utilizing equations of equilibrium. And my equations of equilibrium are sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, and sum of moments. So these are my three tools. Those are my three tools that I've got um, to solve this structure. Okay. So what I want to try and do is I want to use each one of these tools one, uh, one by one and see if I can use these three tools to solve for my uh, uh, three unknowns. So right off the bat, does anybody have an idea of what they think the easiest one to solve is? AX. AX, right. So AX is going to be the easiest one. So what I can do is I'll say let's use this first tool, sum of forces in the X direction, but we can identify this visually and we can just look at this and say AX is what? AX is zero. That, that one's easy. Okay. Now, now we have to be a little uh, crafty and a little strategic in, in how we assess the problem. So what we could do is we could sum forces, let's say, in the vertical direction. We could sum forces in the y direction right now. But that probably wouldn't be the most uh, advantageous way to solve the problem quickly. Okay? Because if I sum forces in the vertical direction, what I've got is I've got two unknowns. Okay? I've got AY and BY acting upwards, and I've got a bunch of load acting downwards. So if I sum forces in the vertical direction right now, I'm not going to yield a single unknown answer. Uh, and so a way that I can get around that is to potentially use the, the sum of moments expression. Now, if you remember from statics, um, what we try and do is we try and be pretty choosy when we write our, our sum of moments expression. We like to sum moments about a particular point that eliminates as many potential unknowns uh, as possible. So if you had to choose, where would you like to sum moments about? What point would you choose? A. Hey, okay, let's choose that. All right. So let's sum moments. Let's sum moments about point A. Now, oh, now if you've never um, had me for statics, um, you know that uh, I kind of do this a little differently. And I'm not sure if we did it this way uh, in statics, but this is how we're, we're definitely going to do it, or at least how I'm going to do it here on the board. The way that I like to sum moments uh, for problems like this, particularly in this course where we can have a lot of forces, is I like to draw myself a little table. Okay, and what I will do is put all of the moments that are acting this way on this side and all of the moments that are acting this way on this side. Because if you're summing moments and saying the sum of moments equals zero, all you're saying is that all the moments that are rotating uh, clockwise have to equal all the moments that are rotating counterclockwise. So it's kind of easy to just um, derive it in a table fashion. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of like keep my frame of reference here at A, and I'm just going to look at each force one by one and ask if they contribute moment at A. So AX, AX doesn't contribute any moment at A because even if it did, even if theoretically it would, the force is zero. So there's no moment there. Does AY contribute any moment at A? No. Why? Because it's going right through it, right? Because remember, we need a force times a moment arm. Okay? Remember, uh, remember that. Okay? So let's start off with the 20 kips. Does the 20 kips cause any moment at A? Does it want to rotate point A? Yes. Okay. So 20 kips does want to rotate point A. Does it want to rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Because here's point A, and 20 kips is wanting to rotate it like this. Okay. Now the next question is, what is our moment arm? How far from A is that, that moment arm? Six feet. Six feet. So what I'm going to do is over here on the left side, I'm going to put 20 kips, six feet. Okay. So we'll do that. All right, so again, we just take each force one at a time. Next up, we got the 30 kips. Does the 30 kips want to rotate point A? Yes. Left side of the table or the right side of the table? Left. All right, and what's our moment arm? Is it 9 feet? 15. It's 15 feet. The distance from A, the shortest distance from A to the line of action of that force. So it's 30 times 15. All right. Next up, the 18 kips. I think it's going to go on the left side of the table as well. What's my moment arm going to be? 22. 22. All right. Now, what about BY? Does BY want to generate moment at A? Yes, it is wanting to rotate it in the opposite direction. So I need to put BY over here 
Add a moment arm up. There we go. And there's all the forces on the problem, uh, on the structure because we we sort of resolved ax and ay to not contribute moment at a, and we've got one, two, three, four, no other forces on the system. Okay, so pretty straightforward. So now all we need to do is just sum everything up on the left column and the right column and just knock it out. So what is twenty? Let's see if I can do some of this in my head. Twenty times six. That's 120. Uh, 30 times 15, that's 450. Uh, 18 times 22. Might need a little help on that one. Uh, anybody brought their Casio FX 115 ES? 396. There we go. 396. All right, so 150 or 120, 450, uh, and 396, we add that up and we get what? Um, 966 foot kips, is that right? Which, by the way, for those of you in the back, if this is too small or if there's something you can't read, don't hesitate. Just let me know. Um, and so 966 foot kips, that has to be equal to all the moment acting the other way, which is just by times 30 feet. So we, whoop, it's a little big. So we, just algebra problem, pretty easy. Take both sides, divide it by 30 feet, 30 feet, and then therefore. So again, if you see those three dots, that just means therefore. By equals what? I might need your help on this one. What is By equal? Say it again. 32.2 foot. 32.2 uh, yep. So first off, do I have a second on that? Okay. So if you've never had me for class before, uh, we usually ask for a calculation and then ask for a second to make sure we're all getting the same thing. So that's 32.2. And what are the units? Kips. kips. There we go. 32.2 kips. And Mathematically, we yielded a positive answer from this because that number divided by that is positive. And because that's positive, what that means is that our assumed direction was correct. So we assume that BY is acting upward. 32.2 kips is indeed acting upwards. Okay? So, what's left? What do I have to do to finish this problem out? Sum the forces in the y direction, because I've already utilized some forces in the x direction, already utilized some moments, and I have one remaining unknown. So we just need to sum forces in the y direction. So let's, I don't know, let's stick that down here. So we'll say sum of forces in the y direction. Uh, and what I will do is I will draw another table. And what I like to do is put everything going up on, uh, on one side, everything going down on the other, uh, and just list it out. So, do I need to worry about AX? Even if it had a value, would I need to worry about it? No, because it's not a vertical force, or uh, it's a horizontal force. So what do I have going up? I have AY and BY. So what we'll do is we'll say, I need to put AY up here, or AY like this, but I also need to put BY, but the difference is I now know what BY is. It's 32, positive 32.2 kips. Um, and then downward, what I've got is 20, 30, and 18. So 20, 30, and 18. Zoom that down a little bit. And so that's, that's everything that I have here on my system. And so AY, so sum everything up in that left column, sum everything up in that right column. So AY plus 32.2 kips equals, so 20 and 30 is 50, plus 18 is 68. So therefore, AY, what is AY going to be? 35.8. Say it again? 35.8, uh, positive, right? 35.8 and units? Kips. Kips, do I have a second? There we go. And because that's positive, I have 35.8 kips acting in the direction that I assume, which is upward. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is since I've got a bunch of answers in a bunch of different spots here uh, on the, the board, as it were, is I'm going to um, put myself a little summary down here. We'll just put it right here. And we'll have AX is zero. AY is 35.8 kips upwards, 
BY is 32.2 kips upwards. And that is all there is to it. Sometimes I'll, I'll shorten that up and just put A and S for answers. But has it been a while since you've done a problem like that? Been a little while? Is that, I know some of you didn't have me for sex. Is that the first time you've seen it done like this with the table? Is that okay? You like the table? Is that, okay. Is that how you would prefer us to do it on homework? That's a good question. I'm fine with anything. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to micromanage uh, how you do it. Some folks like writing out the equation. Some folks like doing it like this. I'm fine with either. It's what, I'd rather you perform the calculations in the way that you're most comfortable. So as long as you get the right answer, I'm, I'm fine either way. So, so. Any questions? All right. So, so far, so good. So now we're going to take this and we're going to ratchet it up just a little bit. And then we're going to, like I said, we're just going to keep ratcheting it up just a little bit. We take it slow. But by the time you look at our last reactions problem, when we have concentrated moments and hinges and all sorts of different loads, you'll see that it's really not that bad. My, my general point about structural analysis problems is that once you break it down, um, they might be longer, but hopefully they're not more complicated uh, than this. That's kind of the, uh, the overall point. All right, so let's take a step back. Um, uh, do I need to go back to the, the, the board, by the way? Was anybody still writing? Okay, so we're doing great on time. Okay, so that last problem, um, what we had was a structure that was subjected to concentrated loads. You, uh, you will hear me use the term concentrated loads and point loads interchangeably. So I just will throw that out there right off the bat. Um, Remember, uh, one of the points I made at the very beginning is that um, we are uh, not analyzing structures, but we're analyzing these models that represent them. And again, it's a subtle distinction, but it is kind of important. But what it means is that we, as the analysts, have different means by which we can model loads. And another way that we can model loads is to model them as distributed loads. So in other words, instead of you know, this previous uh, problem where I had 20 kits all lumped at one point, Instead, maybe I take that load and I spread it out uh, over the beam. Um, now, there are reasons for doing that, and one of the reasons is it's reflective of what's going on uh, in the real world and how we spec loads out uh, in code specifications. Oh, whoop, sorry. Um, so I, I have here an example. Um, this is a, a picture of a uh, like ballroom that you would find maybe in a large hotel or convention center uh, uh, type uh, 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 setting. Um, and if you notice, there are oodles of, of people uh, in the building or in the room. Um, each of those, so, so let's think about this from an, uh, an analysis perspective, okay? Um, each one of those people could be modeled as a point load, right? They each are standing in different spots uh, in, the, uh, in the room. They each have a different weight. So we could locate each one of those people we could compute their weight and model them as point loads on the floor. We could do that. But I'm sure that some of you are thinking, as that's, bless you, as that's coming out of my mouth, that sounds kind of ridiculous, right? Why does that sound ridiculous, though? I'm curious. Why would you not want to do that? Like, why would computing the weights of every person in this room and locating them and applying point loads, why does that sound like a silly idea? It's time consuming. It's time consuming. That, you're right. That's that is one reason why that sounds silly. What's another reason it sounds silly? Not everybody's the same way. That's exactly right. What's another reason it sounds silly? They're going to move uh, They're moving. I, I, that's exactly what I'm doing. These are transient loads. These are not. These are not permanent stationary loads. They move around. Um, there are just oodles of reasons why this is. This would be a bad idea. Uh, instead, what we would do in the real world, oh, sorry, I hit the button again. What we would do in the real world is we would model this essentially as a pressure load. So what we might do is we might look at a room like this and say, instead of designing it for all these people, what we're going to design it for is a number, let's make up a number, let's say 100 pounds per square foot. So every square foot of the floor, we're going to assume 100 pounds. So we're going to have this pressure load 
uh, applied to the floor. And then we can take that load and distribute it to, let's say, our beam elements as distributed loads and then compute those reactions. And then those reactions uh, can, can ultimately go to the columns in the ground. Uh, and that's how we model uh, uh, structures in this fashion. The, the actual number, the load that we apply, it depends on the um, it depends on the type of structure that we're designing. I'll give you some close to home examples. So if you're designing a facility like a Weisberg Applied Engineering Complex, like this this uh, this building, um, what you might do is you might design the classrooms for something like 50 pounds per square foot, whereas you might design the hallways for 80 pounds per square foot. Why would you design the hallways for a higher load than the classrooms? They have more food. A more con exactly, there's a more concentrated amount of people per square foot potentially in the hallways than they are in the classrooms. Another reason you might consider is um, if there's an emergency in the building, then there's going to be a lot of people in, in the hallways. Um, this actually, uh, there's there's a very um, uh, uh, there's a very significant difference that you can find in structural philosophy depending upon the type of building that you're designing. So. Um, that's a really fancy way of describing this example, but you'll find different approaches to designing, let's say, a hotel versus designing a commercial office building. So in a hotel, um, you know where the hotel rooms are and you know where the hallways are, and they don't really change, right? The hotels are, with hotels, the hallways are here and the rooms are here. So as a structural designer, you can pretty much with confidence say, that's going to be 50 pounds per square foot, and that's going to be 80 pounds per square foot. Um, commercial office buildings, though, are, are, are a little different. Has anybody ever been in a large commercial office building? You know, I'm sure many of you have. Well, when you're developing that space, let's say you're the owner of the building, what you do as, a, uh, as an owner is you're selling that space off to you know, a, a law office, a dentist office, an accounting firm, what have you, you're selling that as a per square foot basis, right? And to be, to be honest, you kind of want the flexibility to configure that space however you want because you want to sell as much of that space as you can, right? So as a structural engineer, what you might do is design the entire floor as if it was one big hallway. Because, yeah, there might be some conservatism built in it, but you don't want to be... Um, constrained by, well, the hallways have to go here and the offices going to have to go here. You want to be able to configure that however it needs to be configured. So when you're designing, let's say, a commercial office building, you might use a different approach than you would, say, a, a, a hospital or a hotel or something like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, in terms of the shape of those loads, one thing I should mention is that not only do we have uh, uh, loads that would be uniformly distributed. So for in this previous slide, I would basically assume a constant pressure load across the entire floor system, and then to each beam, to each flexural element, we would see a uniformly distributed load. Um, we'll talk later on in the semester about how to actually do that. It's through a concept called tributary area. We're going to do that uh, near the end, so, so don't worry. We will cover that. Um, but uh, in terms of the shape of distributed loads, they can be uniformly distributed like this, or they can be triangular. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, come on, do we really see triangular loads in the real world? Yes, we do. Okay, And there are two um, real examples of that. And I, I can actually give you three here in a little bit, um, but I'll, I'll mention two that are really easy to, to illustrate. Um, the first is looking at hydrostatic effects. So if you're looking at um, forces related uh, that you would see on a um, on a dam or a retaining wall or something like that. Is anybody in fluids right now? I'm just curious. So for those of you that are in fluids, you'll know or you'll learn real quick that pressure changes linearly as a function of depth. So the deeper that you get, the, the increase, the, the magnitude of that um, lateral load will increase. So if we're looking at, let's say, a retaining wall, the load that that wall experiences from the water is triangular uh, in nature, okay? Um, and whether it's water or earth or something like that, um, those loads uh, are, are distributed in a triangular fashion. Another um, load that you see in a triangular fashion is what's called a snow drift, okay? So snow drift happens on roofs that are kind of like this. Has anybody ever been on 
the roof of a commercial office building or a building like this. Anybody ever been on a roof of a building like this? It, it, let me ask you this. Is the roof like that? No, it, it's pretty flat, right? It's flat. Uh, it's not totally flat because it's got to slope a little for, for drainage and whatnot. But for the most part, it's pretty flat. And there's usually like a little curtain wall that sticks around the, um, uh, around the length of the roof. And usually the curtain wall comes up to about like that. Something like that. If you want a good view of it, go to the green roof. You can see on the third floor on this end of the building, you can see the glass door that will show you where the green roof is. And you can see the wall that comes up about like this. Well, we're in the state of West Virginia, so take a month like February, and what happens? It snows, right? So you take February, it snows. So we get a little bit of snow on the roof. And I don't know about you, but if I've ever been in a snowstorm, not only is it snowing, but it is windy, right? So what happens is it's windy, okay? So there's snow on the roof, and then there's wind. What happens is the wind piles that um, snow up on the side uh, of the roof, maybe piled up, bunched up against one of those curtain walls that I mentioned, and we get this sort of triangular distribution of snow uh, there on the roof, and we call that a snow drift, okay? And do we have to account for that as structural engineers? Yeah, because we've got this high concentration of snow packed up uh, on the side of the roof. Uh, and we don't want the roof to fail uh, under snow loads. And has that happened before? Yeah, uh, it's happened. Um, and another way you can get uh, triangular distribution is a little harder to see. But if you have beam elements that are just not arranged in a rectangular grid-like fashion, like if you have beam elements that are sort of spiraling out, the tributary area on each one can, uh, can distribute loads in a triangular fashion. That will be a little easier to explain when we uh, get towards the end of the semester. But my point with this is I want you to see that we actually do have to deal with triangular loads uh, as civil engineers. Now, the way that we deal with that from a structural analysis perspective is we break out our old friend, the centroid. Okay? So what we do is um, we take our distributed load, and the way I like to think of it is I take my distributed load and I think this whole area, let's just sort of treat that as a rectangle. Okay? And if you remember, like, when you, um, when you took statics, I mean, what is the centroid? The centroid is a location where, which you can collect that area as a single magnitude at that point, and it will have force and moment equilibrium, so it's, it's statically equivalent. So what I can do is I can replace this distributed load with a single point load right here. What is the magnitude of that load? It's the area of that rectangle, the uh, magnitude of the load times the length. Um, and where do I put it? I put it where the centroid of that rectangle is. And by placing it there, it has static equivalency to the distributed load. So this right here, this distributed load and this point load are statically equivalent. Same magnitude located at, the, uh, at where the centroid is. Okay. Now, for a uh, triangular load, so I do the same thing, but I got to be cautious about the details. So for a triangular load, um, where is the, well, first off, what is the magnitude of that load? Bless you. What's the magnitude of that load? What's the area of the triangle? What's the area of the triangle? The height times the width over two. So I got to cut that in half. Uh, and where do I place it? If you remember, where is the centroid of a triangle? It's a third away from the, uh, uh, from the right angle, not halfway, it's a third of the way. Does that make sense? So if this distance was, I don't know, 18 feet, from here to here, that's six feet, okay? Now, I, I have this little note here. This I don't want to say you can, I don't want you to ignore it, but you can sort of put it off in the back of your head for now. Um, this, this technique works when you're um, uh, computing uh, support reactions. When we get to the point later on where we're drawing shear and moment diagrams, we just need to make sure that when we're constructing the shear and moment diagrams, we're referencing the loads that are actually on the structure, not these analytical simplifications that we made. Um, that doesn't really matter now, um, but when we get to shear and moment diagrams later, it's just something that I want uh, in the back of your head. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's get to our next example. Dude, we're rocking and rolling. All right. All right, so let me blow this up a little bit. Okay, so 
So um, I have here another example for you. And um, first off, the boundary conditions that I used haven't changed. I'm still using a pin boundary condition and a roller boundary condition. But I have changed where they go. Um, instead of a simply supported situation where they're at the ends, I put one roller inside. So I've created what's called an overhanging beam. Okay. Um, so I've got an overhanging beam. Now I still have a pin and roller boundary condition, so it's the same amount of unknowns. So we'll call this a y. Call this a x. Call that by. So, so no different there. Okay. One thing I'll, I'll ask before we get to the distributed loads: Does putting this roller here versus there does it really change our overall approach to the problem? No. I mean, it's, it'll it moving that roller would change the support reaction, but in the end, the system still has to be in static equilibrium. So, it really doesn't matter where the uh, where the roller is. Okay. Now. Um, before I deal with the distributed loads, is there any reaction I can just solve for right now? AX. AX, there we go. And we can do that by recognizing that if the sum of the forces in the X direction is zero, again, this time, what is AX? Zero. Now, here's the thing, bless you. I know that um, some of you might be thinking, do we really have to do that for every problem, the sum of the forces in the X direction? The answer is yes. Because there are going to be some structures later, some frames and some trusses, where that X reaction is not zero. And so I do want you to go through the process of like checking off each equation of equilibrium and make sure that you're not forgetting one. Because like later on, when we start looking at things like trust deflections or trust analyses, like if you don't have all of your reactions correct, it feels like you're, you're a dog chasing your tail, like you're doing the analysis and it's not working and you don't know why. It's, because you didn't handle all your equations of equilibrium. So I want to make sure that you're accounting for it. Okay. Now, let's look at these distributed loads. Now, the way that I'm going to handle these distributed loads is I want to start off by looking at, let's start off with this, this one on the right. So I'm going to draw a little rectangle up here just to sort of represent. Bless you. Now, Allergies this week, I'm telling you. All right, so don't feel bad. I'm, I'm, I've got it myself. So we have, what I'm doing is I'm looking at this uh, rectangle right here, and, and I'm using the word rectangle because I just want to treat it like it's a shape like any other uh, in the land of, uh, of statics. So if I was looking at this rectangle, how wide is it? Well, it's 22 feet wide. And what I'm going to do is say, in terms of the height, I'm going to say it's 1.5 tall, or 1.5 kips per foot tall. So, a quick question, what is the area of this rectangle? How would you compute the area? Well, it would just be length times width. What is that? 33 kips. 33 kips, okay? So, if I were to idealize this as a single load, I would idealize it as a load with a magnitude of 33 kips. Now, where would I put that load? How far to the right from B do I put that load? 11, 11 feet. So what I'm going to do is idealize this. So I sort of drew it as a dashed line of a load that's 33 kips in magnitude and from B a distance of 11 feet. Okay. So that's going to be the uh, my resolution of that uh, that distributed load, and so I'm going to apply the same process to this triangular load over here. So let's see. Let's just sort of do that up here, just to just to have a similar um, um, image Okay. So the width of this load, there we go. So 
the width of that load is 15 feet, and the height, we're going to call that 2.4 kips per foot. So this is this red triangle up here is just my representation of this triangle right here. So if I were to idealize that as a concentrated load, what would its magnitude be? 18 kips. Okay, now you got 18 kips by saying 2.4 times 15, which is 36, but 36 over 2. Remember, it's a triangle. You got to cut that in half. So that's 18 kips. Now, if I were to locate that from A, how far over from A do I put that load? Five feet. Five feet, because it's a triangle, so it's a third of the way over, right? So we've got. Eighteen kips. So five feet. Okay. So now here's the thing. We had these distributed loads, but now we've taken those distributed loads and idealized them as concentrated forces. There's really not a whole lot different between the approach to this problem and the last one we just did. I just took a little bit of extra work to, to um, express it in a fashion that made sense. So what am I going to do? I'm going to handle this the same way. So I'm going to start off by summing moments. Now, where, do you, where would you like me to sum moments about? Your, your choice. A. Let's just do A again. Okay, just like we did last time. And like I said, what I'll do is just start at the left, work my way over, just make sure I don't forget anything. So do I need to deal with AX or AY? No. What about this 18 kits? Do I need to consider that? Yes. Left side or the right side of the table? Left side. And moment arm? Five feet. Five feet. See? It's all coming back. All right. Now... So we've got this, this, this. What about this 10 kips? So I need to consider that? Yeah. Yes. Left side or right side? Yeah. And what is my moment arm going to be? 22.5. 22 22.5 feet because I've got 15 and then another one of that makes that 22.5. Okay. All right. So now let's see. We've got so start at the left. Got that, 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 that. We go ahead and put our reaction on here. Which side of the table does the reaction need to go? Right. Right. And what's my moment arm? Thirty feet. Okay. And finally, we've got this thirty-three kips. Now, what's my moment arm going to be? Forty-one feet. So it, I know it's tempting on problems like this to say it's 11. No, remember, our, our point of reference is from A. So from A, the shortest distance to that line of action is 30 plus the 11. Makes that 41. All right, everybody okay with that? Remember, as we're doing these problems, if you've got a question, don't you hesitate. I want to make sure that you all are getting value out of this. Okay. So let's take it one step at a time. Somebody help me out with this column right here. So 18 times 5 plus this times that plus that times that. Handling this, what do we get right here? 1668. 1668. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. All right. I heard you. Okay. I want to show you something real quick. So um, sometimes you'll see me in this uh, class. I'll use some shorthand notation. And so I will say foot kit. So if I use this symbol right here, so that's just a shorthand way of saying foot kip, so it's a lot faster, so I, I will do that a, a, a fair amount. And one thing I will say in this course, I haven't really mentioned this, but for the most part, U.S. units. We're very rarely going to be dealing with SI uh, in here because you go to Lowe's and they don't have metric lumber. It's two by fours. Until we start... Um, building things uh, for the most part in the United States and SI units. I want to adhere to what you know we're actually doing. Okay, so by times thirty feet. So therefore, 
BY is going to be a positive number. And what is that going to be? 55.67. And what else? One thing I'll say in this class, I don't get too worked up over significant figures in this uh, course, so, so don't worry about that. I'm more just interested in that the analysis techniques make sense. I'll put it to two decimal places. I think everybody kind of recognizes that that's, you know, a third, but, um, but that'll be fine. Uh, and then this is a positive reaction, which indicates 55.67 kips going up. So far, so good? Okay, so what's the last thing I need to do? Some force in the y direction, there we go. So we'll sum forces in the y direction. Okay, we sum forces in the y direction. Let me zoom up a little bit. I try, I, I do my best to try and not be that professor that's like scrolling up and down the screen and you're like, it's going on, so I, I really try and lighten that up as much as I can. Okay, uh, so uh, going up, we have A, Y, and B, Y, and like last time, we actually have B, Y figured out. So we have A, Y going up. We have B, Y going up, but B, Y is 55.67. Uh, and then going down, let's see, we have 18, 10, and 33. So we have AY plus 55.67 kips equals, okay, so 18 and 10 is 28, 28 and 33 is 61. So 61 kips. Bless you. And AY is, I think it's also going to be positive. And what is that? That 4 point or 5.33, right? So plus 5.33 kips, which is 5.33 kips. Going up. So to summarize, I'll put a little summary right here. So I do like to see a summary uh, at the end just to make sure that you know, you're know you capturing all your reactions. So AX is zero, AY is 5.33 kips going up. And, and ultimately what I care about with the reactions is the magnitude and direction. Whether they're positive or negative doesn't really matter so much because you're assuming a direction and whether it's positive is just a reflection of whether or not your assumption was correct. But in the end, regardless of what you assume or you assume or you assume or you assume, everybody should get 5.33 up and 55.67 up. That's sort of the truth that is independent of your assumption. All right, any questions? So I've got another problem for you where you've got two analysis problems. I think they'll be pretty quick. Um, that will be due Monday. Uh, if you have any questions, you can let me know. I'll try and make any posts and teams that we're clarifying those for everybody. With that, y'all have a good weekend. I will see you on Monday.